So on this surgical front, on this pharmacologic front, we have made amazing progress. We haven't made progress on the nutritional front. Are we going to? Not clear. You know, a, a New York Times reporter called me a few years ago, and this was in response. To, there, there was an article about President, I think it was President Taft, who was very obese, and somebody had found some letters between him and his physician talking about diet. And it was almost, you could have picked those letters up and said this was between a president and his or her physician today, and they would make equal sense. And the reporter said to me, and this is a very bright science nutrition journalist, said to me, David, why have we made so little progress? Why have we not been able to find the diet that reliably causes sustained weight loss? And I said, your question is premised on the idea that there is a diet that reliably causes sustained weight loss. Why should we believe that that's true? So that's an important thing to think about. I think one of the things that is perhaps a misperception and maybe a very problematic one in our field around nutrition and weight loss or food intake and weight loss is that there is a good diet with respect to weight loss, particularly such that for most, if not all people, if you just ate the right way, you wouldn't have to count your calories, you wouldn't have to be uncomfortable and hungry, you wouldn't have to feel deprived, and yet you would maintain a good, healthy weight. I know of no reason to believe that's true. Um, I know lots of people who, who argue, is it diet A or diet B? Right? So this one thinks it's low carb, and this one thinks it's high carb or low fat, and this one thinks it's don't eat at night, and this one thinks it's, you know, whatever it is, uh, eat paleo, you know, et cetera. Um, I'm just, maybe the null hypothesis is, you know, doesn't matter that much. Um, there isn't such a diet for, for many people. Now, for some people, they do maintain a normal, healthy, desirable weight without trying to restrict their energy. But maybe for others, it's just not the case. I think the paths forward are manifold. And I think in some cases, we are on the good path. And in some cases, we are wandering in the drunkard's walk. We're on the good path, I think, on surgery and pharmaceuticals. Clearly a long way to go, but they've gotten much better. I'd love to see more funding for those for good research. And I think we need to, we are on a good path, but I think we need to get on a much better path about, as a society, making those available to people, right? If you have cancer, we're willing to treat you. If you have obesity, eh, maybe not, right? So if you're rich, you can pay for that. If you're not rich, what do you do? So I'd love to see more access to care. And I think we're on a better path, but we need to be on a better path still. I think we're on a good path on stigma. A long way to go, but I think as a society, we've woken up to say stigmatizing obese people is not okay. Do you think the pendulum's gone too far? I, I read something, I, this might have been a joke, but I literally read that um, Adele was actually shamed for losing weight. I don't know if that's true, but if it was, it would certainly suggest that the pendulum has gone a little too far the other direction. I would certainly say that that's ridiculous. I don't know if she was or wasn't, but if she was, that's ridiculous. Um, to me, the, the take home message is shaming people about their body habitus is not good in either direction. It's not a directional thing, right? It's just shaming people about their body habitus is not okay. And, you know, sometimes the counter argument is, but it's good for them because it'll help them want to lose weight. And sometimes the argument made against the shaming is empirical. It's, well, the evidence shows that people who experience a lot of weight shaming gain more weight. And then the causal thing is thrown in. And then people say, therefore, you shouldn't do it. I'm like, you mean if shaming didn't cause weight gain, it would be OK to be immoral and cruel to others? No. I mean, if you replace things like sex and race in that sentence, you're like, no, it's not OK to shame and denigrate people because of their sex, race, age, body habitus, regardless of whether it causes weight loss or weight gain. Period. It's a moral issue. It's not an empirical issue. And I think that's, we have a long way to go, but I think we're making progress in people. Yeah, I guess, I guess we can generalize this idea that 
You shouldn't denigrate people because of age, race, sex. Maybe you shouldn't denigrate them for other characteristics that are not you know, moral failings. Um, I think that on the basic science, we're making progress. We could make better progress if we tightened up the rigor of our science. We could make better progress if we had more funding. And many groups, including the National Academy of Sciences, and I'm, I'm on a strategic council to increase the rigor of science, all of science, not just obesity and nutrition. But we're making progress. We know so much more about genes and physiology and metabolism and cells with respect to obesity and nutrition than we knew 20, 30, 40 years ago. The one area where, as far as I can tell, we are not making progress, and I don't think we are yet on a good path, I don't think we're on a path at all, is the sort of public health community, school-based, community-based, policy-based approach. I think we are continuing to look for our keys under the lampposts because that's where the light is as opposed to where the keys might be. I think we are continuing to ignore the data and keep saying the same old hackneyed suggestions that people have been trying for decades and that when you really look at the data have been at best not been shown to work and at worst been shown to not work. And I think there are some people who are patently obfuscating those data. I think the cluster randomized trials we see in the childhood obesity literature, you know, bring to mind the phrase that rhymes with cluster muck. And it just, this is cluster muck. This is distorted evidence. This is science gone wrong in the worst sense. I think we've got to clean that up. We've got to clean up the quality of the science we do and start treating this like science just as much as the science quarks or tires on automobiles or beta cells of pancreases and treat it like real science and take it just as seriously. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit Peter Atia, MD dot com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.